Ladies and gentlemen, our guest tonight is Mr. Viv Forbes. Briefly, his background has been in coal, uranium, oil, economics and geology. He worked in mining finance and investment for Goldfields in Sydney and Mount Isa Mines in Brisbane. He's now a consultant mineral economist and chairman of directors of Coho Australia Limited, an oil exploration company. Many of you would know him, his background, in the free enterprise movement. He's also been the founding president of Taxpayers United more recently. In his past, he was director of the Foundation for Economic Education and publisher of the newsletter Common Sense. His address tonight, Tax Freedom Day. Would you please welcome Mr. Dick Forbes. Thank you, Tony. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I like the response of the audience. I read in the paper the other day where a burglar broke into the home of a tax collector. The story isn't over, though, because a terrific struggle ensued the thief managed to escape. The tax man called the police and uh, the police caught the culprit after a fairly short chase. And the police sergeant ran, rang the uh, victim to tell him the good news, and adding that they'd recovered $60 from the burglar's pocket. I know, said the tax man, he had $90 when he broke in. <laughs> was luckier than the average Australian. <laughs> he lost only one third of his earnings to the tax man. The gross domestic product of Australia, that is what we all produce, in 1985 is expected to be about $206 billion. The federal taxes on income, and this is pay as you earn tax, company tax, prescribed payments tax and Medicare tax, will absorb 36 billion or 17% of GDP. Thus, the average Australian who starts work on New Year's Day will work for over two months until March the 5th just to pay a share of federal income tax. Another fortnight must he labour to pay the sales taxes and import taxes levied on all the goods he buys. By April Fool's Day, He's managed to pay his oil, petrol and motoring taxes, stamp duties on cheques and documents. Next comes payroll tax, which is the penalty for employing the taxes on beer and tobacco. Provided he wastes nothing on rent and housekeeping, the average Australian should have these tax bills paid by the middle of April. Then they come thick and fast. Taxes on land, gambling, racing, banking, broadcasting, building, milk, bread, wool and wheat, plus export duties, research levies, passport fees, business permits and job licence fees. By the end of April, Australian taxpayers have paid all their open direct taxes, which now totals $66 billion per year. That's not the end of the story. Their spending is not limited to the taxes they raise. In 1985, tax revenue covers only 72% of government spending. They need to find another 25 billion. One way or another, we will all pay this tax by way of inflation, devaluation, higher interest rates, increased utility charges, or future taxes. As winter sets in, on the 12th day of June, the average Australian escapes from the tax man and, like the unfortunate burglar, runs screaming down the street. Having paid 44% of his income to support governments, he then starts to work for private luxuries like food, clothing and shelter. <laughs> Today is Tax Freedom Day 1985. Ladies and gentlemen, please charge your glasses and be upstanding for a tax. <laughs> I give you tax freedom in our time. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs>
It was Mark Twain, I think. He said, no man's life, liberty or property is safe while Parliament is sitting. <laughs> A look at their taxation record shows that this was not said in jest. Australian government authorities are currently spending about $91,000 million per year. No matter how you say it or how you try to hide it, that represents the total of tax paid by the Australian people. And any talk of tax reform, which does not focus on government expenditure, is merely the bureaucratic equivalent of breaking wind. <laughs> that is the trend of government spending. This is uh, state and local spending, that's total government spending. For comparison, this little line down the bottom here is the profit of all listed public companies in Australia. Now that graph there hasn't been updated. In the little satchel of things on your, on your chair, you'll find an updated one. It's gone right up the top here, it's now at 91, and this one's gone over here to there. So that gives you some idea of the total tax burden. Would you repeat that, please, Miss? Would you repeat that? That graph uh, shows you the total trend of tax, uh, uh, of government spending. The graphs in your satchel show you the updating of those, and they're fairly self-explanatory. And what it says is $91,000 million is spent every year by Australian government authorities. And that's a pretty big figure to get a handle on. Fairly hard for people like us to visualise what that means. When I was a poor university student, we used to measure most things in malted milks. I had to go to the movies with five malted milks. I can tell you it's a lot of malted milks. <laughs> I can also tell you it's about... 40 uh, Medicare's, but nobody has any real idea of the enormous cost of Medicare either. So I've uh, looked at another way to judge the size of government spending. And I've looked at the listed public companies, the big corporations of Australia. Now let's look at the biggest corporation in Australia, which is BHP. Almost on the screen. That's BHP Steelworks. BHP is our biggest company. It's one of the great steel makers of the world. It also owns 50% uh, of Australia's biggest oil fields in Bass Strait, which are world size oil fields. It probably owns the biggest coal resources in the world, is the biggest coal exporter in the world. It owns a big share of uh, some of the biggest iron ore mines in the world at Mount Newman. That's, that's Groot Island, the world's biggest manganese mine, owned 100% by BHP. So BHP is a fairly big company. If you add to all of those assets of BHP, the World Mining House of CRA, which stretches from Broken Hill to the Pilbara and across the world. Add the fabulous Mount Isa mine, plus its associated mines, smelters and refineries in Queensland and Western Australia, London, Germany and the Americas. Add the nickel mines, smelters and refineries of Cambalda, Kalgoorlie and Quinan. The aluminium empires of Kamalco and Nabalco. The oil and gas resources of Santos, Woodside and Ampol. The rich mines of copper at Bougainville, lead zinc at Broken Hill, gold at Tennant Creek, Gidston and Kalgoorlie and diamonds in the Kimberleys. The mines and smelters of electrolytic zinc in Tasmania. The other deposits of iron owned by other companies in the Pilbara. The riches of uranium in the Northern Territory and the coal in central Queensland. Add to all of those mining assets the financial assets of Westpac, the ANZ, the National, AGC, MLC, Lend Lease, General Property Trust and Industrial Equity. Add the pastoral and other assets of CSR and Elders IXL. And the stores of coals, mires and woolworths. <laughs> there we are. That's the transport facilities of TNT, ANSET, Brambles, Main Nicholas, the Bell Group, and Adelaide Steamship Company. 
at all the breweries and pubs of Carlton and United in Castlemaine. Then at the paper empires of APM, News Limited, John Fairfax, the Herald and Weekly Times. Finally, add to all that, the factories and industrial resources of ACI, Dunlop, Boral, Pioneer Concrete, James Hardy, ICI and Emmetil. When you add all of those assets of Australia's top 46 listed public companies, you get a market valuation of $45 billion. You could buy the lot for $45 billion. If you double that, you get a measure of the money spent every year by Australian government authorities. Looked at in another way, Australia has something like 1,000 listed public companies. Their total market capitalisation is about $83 billion. This means governments are spending the equivalent of the total corporate wealth of Australia every 11 months. We are indeed consuming our seed corn. People uh, often say to me, or ask me, uh, how to get into a small business. With taxation levels like we have in Australia, it's easy. You just buy a big one and wait. <laughs> Incidentally, we have a few misguided people around who believe that if only we could soak the rich, all would be well for the rest of us. Let us define the rich as anyone with taxable income of over $40,000 per year. According to the latest statistics produced by the Chief Taxer, there are about 88,000 individuals in Australia with taxable incomes above $40,000 per year. The Chief Taxer already takes an average of 42% of their income in income tax alone. If he took the lot, the additional revenue gathered would keep the army of paper doodlers going for just eight working days. <laughs> Incredible though it sounds, Australian governments are currently spending at the rate of $364 million per working day. Soaking the rich is not an option. The bulk of the taxes must be paid, as they always were paid, by the bulk of the people. There are something like 4 million families in Australia. With governments now consuming 90,000 million, it means that governments are determining the spending priorities up to 22,500 per family per year. Somewhere or another we are paying for that. And to meet these liabilities, governments are robbing the savings of the past generation with continuous inflation they are bleeding the earnings of the current generation with excessive taxation, and they are saddling the future generation with excessive debt. A record of plundering, it seems to me, not equal since William the Conqueror. Where does all this money go? A little investigation will show that the public sector, not the private sector, is the chief beneficiary of government spending. slide on taxes. Somebody here said they were an investment analyst. How would you like to get into a growth industry like that? <laughs> <laughs> the apologists for the public service will say that we pay taxes too. Every public employee is a net consumer of tax funds. The average public uh, Federal public servant gets about $20,800 per year out of tax funds and he probably pays about $9,200 in taxes to various government authorities. He is thus a net consumer of tax. And there are a lot of them. Uh, you all had a brochure in your chair. I'd like you to have a look at it. Would those of you with a green spot on the brochure please stand up? <laughs> If this audience represents the workforce of Australia, 
those standing represent those on the public payroll. I can see the soil is much more fertile in Sydney because in Brisbane last year I had to tell them to hiss. <laughs> there are 1,734,000 public employees, one, one in three of the workforce. To pay them an average salary of 20,800 per year requires $36 billion per year, which incidentally gives Canberra the highest per capita income in Australia. Sick leave, long service leave, holiday pay, insurance, superannuation, workers' compensation, fringe benefits, gay leave, etc. <laughs> could easily add, say, 25% of the salaries bill. This indicates that payroll costs alone could absorb $45 billion or 50% of all government expenditure. There's where most of the money goes. There's, that should be a graph showing the uh, growth in the public sector, irrespective of who controls the parliament. What do they all do? They spend their time administering a huge bureaucratic state. We are all being strangled in this. <laughs> the chairman didn't mention that I started my working life off, and this is probably where I got the chip shoulder, I started my working life off working for the government. <laughs> when I left, I stole some real red tape of bureaucrats. <laughs> and I'd like you to reflect for a moment how the dead hand of government has come to intrude into what should be the private life of every individual citizen. And I'd like you to look at a typical citizen whose birth is registered by the government. He will then be hounded by bureaucrats and tax collectors for the rest of his life. While he is a child, they will inspect his toys, control his kindergarten, regulate his schooling, provide his library books and multi sports. <laughs> when he goes to work, they will register his occupation, set his working hours, dictate his wages, force him to join a union and tax every pay payment. Should he decide to start a family, they will license his marriage, inspect his house plans, fluoridate his water supply, connect his telephone, provide his power, Broadcast his news, monopolise his mail, control the price of his food. <laughs> Should he be so foolish as to go into business, <laughs> they will put levies on his production, subsidise his competitors, monopolise the marketing of his products, put quotas and tariffs on the best products available in the market, debase the value of his money, metricate his measurements, confiscate his land, <laughs> tax him for providing jobs, force him to be an unpaid tax collector, legislate his trading hours, set up legal monopolies in banking, transport and communication, and encourage legal cartels in most other industries. <laughs> when at long last he says to hell with it, and turns to wine, women and song, they will censor his entertainment, <laughs> legislate his family arrangement, judge his religious beliefs, prescribe his drinking and gambling habits, print warnings on his cigarette packets, control his travel, <laughs> and put taxes on everything worth having. <laughs> Should he decide to close his business, they will try to prevent him. Should he attempt suicide, they will charge him with damaging government property. <laughs> conditions of his retirement will be laid down in the law books. Finally, after taxing and regulating every activity of his life, they will carefully record the details of his death and then hit him with a tax on the capital gains he is deemed to realise on his death. There's no end to it, ladies and gentlemen. It just goes on. Is it any wonder most of us end up fairly most of us end up We are now 
are so regulated that it is impossible to keep track of, let alone obey, the thousands of complex and sometimes contradictory <coughs> controls, guidelines, regulations and bylaws on our books. In the last 20 years, federal and state governments have passed 16,631 acts and no less, less than 32,600 regulations under those acts. If Moses came down from the mountain today, he would need to carry 49,000 tablets. <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds more are being added in each new session of Parliament. We are surely suffering a severe case of legislative diary. For example, here is the network of approvals which must be obtained before you can commence building in Victoria. <coughs> now I know people over on this side of the room will have difficulty seeing that, but I can assure you it doesn't make any more sense close up. Here is one close up. Some of them are so large I couldn't bring them with me on the plank. This one was produced in Sydney a long time ago, but I'm sure it's worse now. And this is what you need to go through before you can commence building in New South Wales. Here's the chart of procedures to be followed in acquiring a coal mining lease in New South Wales. <laughs> it's happening all over the world. That's how you work out how much income tax you might be liable for in Papua New Guinea. And this wasn't given to us as a service by the government. It was worked out by some poor fool who had to go through the network and left a trial for others to follow. <laughs> they say that what happens in California is going to happen in Australia soon. Here's one from California. <laughs> that is a pile of submissions to governments by for the first of 91 approvals required to build a nuclear facility in California. That nuclear facility was approved in referendum by 66% of the people in California. The bureaucrats said you need 91 approvals those 13 feet high of submissions were required for the first of the 93 approvals. <laughs> now to achieve all of this regulation needs a growing bureaucracy, and boy does it grow. For example, uh, I was reading the Weekend Australian a couple of weeks ago, I saw on the front of it that the Federal Public Service were going to be pretty increase in salary in spite of the fact that they'd been in an offset by the Arbitration Commission or somebody. I saw that on the front page and I looked in a bit further and I saw the uh, National Trust in Victoria wanted an administrator at $40,000 a year. The Australian National Gallery on the same page was paying $39,000 for administrative services manager. And the uh, Canberra School of Art wanted a senior lecturer in their leather workshop at $41,000. So I, I got a bit mad and I... Uh, went through that paper and I outlined in red all of those jobs which were going to be paid for by the taxpayers. I saw taxpayers that were going to pay $30,000 for an accountant with the Australian Bicentennial Authority, an attractive salary in quotes for a director of the State Sports Centre at Homebush, $36,000 for an assistant administrator of the Australian Institute of Sport, 22,000 for an artist in residence at the Walker Institute of Higher Education. $24,000 for a bibliographer with the Australian Institute of Aboriginal Studies. I saw the Commonwealth Parliament wants a Hansard reporter. The South Australian Health Department wants a public relations officer. 
the Victorian Parliament wants a Director of Research. The Northern Territory Parliament wants a Ministerial Assistant who can write quickly on diverse subjects. <laughs> <laughs> the Melbourne City Council wants an Equal Opportunity Coordinator who has, quotes, a commitment to collective decision making. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's all there. The University of Newcastle wants a Vice Chancellor. The Chisholm Institute of Technology wants a tutor in jewellery and silversmithing. The South Australian College of Advanced Education wants a lecturer in printmaking. West Australian Department of Mines wants a mines inspector. The Tasmanian Department of Fisheries is offering $41,000 for an assistant director. No qualifications in fishing were required. <laughs> Telecom wants a public relations journalist. The Mulgrave Shire Council wants a town planner. Can you imagine the job for a town planner for the Mulgrave Shire Council? <laughs> Even though I am a Queenslander, I find that hard to believe. Even the tax department wants to add to our burdens with calls for several valuers. There were ads vacant for 21 directors of various types, 20 ads for administrators, commissioners, executives and managers. In that one newspaper alone, there are government ads for coordinators and planners, reporters and journalists, solicitors and economists, scientists and engineers, auditors, computer operators, librarians, sociologists, archaeologists, doctors, dieticians, social workers, therapists, teachers, lecturers, chefs, resort operators, analysts, advisors, and clerks of all types. The mercenary army of the coming bureaucratic state. In one single newspaper, on one weekend, there were 498 government jobs on offer with a total salary bill of over $16 million per year. It took me about eight hours to add them all up. I added the whole lot. salary offered probably exceeds $30,000 per year. Many of the jobs involve administration and regulation, not production. In all of them, the conscripted taxpayer will be lumbered with the cost, whether or not they use, like, want, approve of, or can afford the service. And in addition to all of those job ads, there were 22 ads for government services, like the ABC advertising their concerts, and the great number plate auction, and government works tenders for millions of dollars. When you do the newspaper job test, and I suggest you do it at any time you like, I've done it three times now, and each time the numbers go up. And from that I conclude that what the government is planning for us is a bureaucrat-led economic recovery. <laughs> so we've got the bureaucrats, we've got the red tape, and we've got the taxes. Aren't we lucky we live in a free society? In fact, people up in Queensland often say to me, why are you bleeding about free enterprise, Viv? We've got free enterprise. And I say to them, that's like the story of Goldilocks and the bears. Because what we have is a mixed economy, not a free economy. And a mixed economy is an economic system which is a mixture of freedom and controls. And as to the a relative mix of freedom and controls, the situation parallels the story of the butcher who advertised rabbit meat and was called before the judge. A customer of yours has complained there is a horse meat in your rabbit meat, said the judge. Yes, Your Honour, said the butcher, there is a, a little horse meat present. How much, said the judge? Oh, well, said the butcher, you might call it a 50-50 a mix. You mean 50% horse meat, said the judge. Oh no, said the butcher. One rabbit, one horse. <laughs> <laughs> that is about the mixture of freedom and controls in our mixed economy of today. Now where else does all the money go? We have seen that the biggest single item of government expenditure is wages and salaries for public employees. As Milton Friedman, I think, said once, uh, I went to Canberra to do good, and I ended up doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> but salaries are only part of the cost. If only one third of our public employees had a telephone, 
the rental cost alone would be $120 million per year. If the same number had a small office, a small office, one third of them had a small office, the office rental could total $800 million per year. We even have to contribute to their leisure and entertainment. Taxpayers recently provided subsidies to allow the opening of Tilly Devines, a women's wine bar in Canberra. The next biggest single item of government expenditure is servicing the growing national debt. Another good growth industry. That's the national debt. This is the interest on the national debt. That is defence spending on comparison with the interest on the national debt. Could you say that again, please, Bill? Those graphs show on the top shows the national debt. And on the bottom shows the interest payments on the national debt. And for comparison, right over this side, the lower black line is defence spending. Government authorities are currently spending over $9,000 million per year on interest payments, one third of which goes up to overseas creditors. There's a fair bit of uh, talk every now and then about what should be our national anthem. When you look at that graph, it seems clear to me it should be advance Australia money. <laughs> Where else does the money go? A huge item of government expenditure is transfer payments. Another $20 billion which may have funded modern machinery, new factories or jobs, or even an extension to the house of some overwrought taxpayer, is consumed by individual and corporate welfare payments, gifts to foreign governments, notice I said governments, not people, and government construction projects. Only a tiny proportion of this huge expenditure will provide any return on the investment. Almost none will return the capital itself, so it has to be spent every year. It is surely symptomatic of our problems that the biggest single construction project in the Southern Hemisphere is Parliament House in Canberra, <coughs> whose flagpole alone will cost $2 million. Just in case you missed it, a flagpole alone will cost $2 million. I uh, estimated when it started it was going to top the 1,000 million. I haven't admitted it has yet, but I'm sure it will. It's a cost plus job. I heard from the contractors. It's the best job they have ever had. <laughs> It's a cost plus job and they keep changing the scope, redesigning it. Halfway through the building of it, they increased the number of parliamentarians. So, of course, they had to increase the building. Another great sinkhole for tax funds is job creation. Now, I'm sure you've got your examples down here, but many of us Brisbane dwellers wondered why perfectly good Brisbane city footpaths were being torn up and replaced with these uh, bricks that fit together, <laughs> these sort of modern equivalent of cobblestones. Now, I came across a brass plaque outside the City Hall which, which explained it all. It was funded by the job pause money, whatever that meant, and it was job creation by the City Council. Now, we all have sympathy for the honest triers who are unable to get a job, but that's another problem altogether caused by government. But for too long have taxpayers been unnecessarily sacrificed on this altar of job creation. While our politicians talk piously about job creation, it's their taxes that are killing jobs. They chase away new investors. They support a wage-fixing system which ensures continuous unemployment for our kids. They allow irresponsible union action to make us uncompetitive in the outside world. They tax people who work they pay people who don't work. <laughs> Their rules and regulations delay and deter new ventures. Then after causing all this massive destruction of jobs, they come to us, the taxpayers, for money for job creation. They have to be fools or hypocrites, and it's time we told them so. Where else does the money go? I've got a file I've been keeping for some several years now. 
file number 708, which is government waste. It's now in two folders about that thick. And I'd love to keep you going for a couple of hours on the sort of things that are in that file, but I'll just have time to give you a, a couple of examples. One example from my home at Free Enterprise State. <coughs> this big ad appeared in the Courier Mail from the Department of Consumer Affairs. It told us dummies how to look after bicycles. <laughs> in that ad, we were advised to replace missing parts, to inflate tyres correctly, and to align wobbly wheels and check brake pads. We were also advised to write for free information on bicycles. Now they, they're putting similar ads in now, but in addition to all that, they put a picture of the minister. <laughs> <laughs> One from Victoria. In Melbourne last year, we saw 11 shop inspectors employed by the government giving evidence against Frank Penhaliarak, who employed 15 people. His crime? He opened his hardware shop at times not approved by the government. For this dreadful crime against society, they fined him half a million dollars. Over in Western Australia, and right now, they are spending a couple of million dollars asking taxpayers to be friendly to tourists. <laughs> One from the federal government. The vote of self-determination on Cocos Island required 488 public servants to administer. One bureaucrat for every six islanders who voted. <laughs> Tom Muren had to charter a Boeing 707 for the trip. Finally, somebody gave me this one yesterday. Tremendous little government publication from the government printing office. It wasn't going to selling too well, so I had it out at a sale of 30 cents. It's about knife safety. I read in the front of this that it was uh, put together by two uh, interdepartmental committees who had four separate discussion groups involving 27 meat inspectors, union representatives and bureaucrats. They produced an 18-page report on knife safety, which basically says, be careful or you might cut yourself. <laughs> as Will Rogers once said, I don't make jokes. I just watch the government and report the facts. <laughs> now, things aren't all as bad as I may have pointed them because some people do try to help, but sometimes their help is a little bit misguided. For example, one of my uh, few remaining Liberal friends is a senator. And hoping to gain my approval, he, uh, he tried to do something about travel expenses of federal public servants, which were running at the rate of $40 million per year. So he was going to initiate moves to stop all their travel. Now, he meant well, but the danger posed to Australia does not come from public servants who are in the air travel. <laughs> it comes from busy bureaucrats in their offices working. <laughs> In fact, from a cost-benefit standpoint, the most harmless bureaucrat imaginable is one who is away from his desk. <laughs> so the real challenge for us is to dream up ways to keep the entire public service in the air all the time. <laughs> in fact, uh, I wrote to my politician friend and suggested he take a trip immediately anyway. <laughs> He's just one senator, but it would be a start. <coughs> in the same vein, we have misguided people continually calling for efficiency in the public service, which I believe shows a total lack of understanding of the system. <laughs> <laughs> if our bureaucrats were to enforce all of the laws and regulations on the books, our economy would grind to a halt. <laughs> And if by any faint chance they were to collect all the taxes the laws provide for, the taxpayers would be bankrupt. We should indeed thank the Lord we don't get all the government we pay for. <laughs> we have other do-gooders around agitating for balanced budgets. 
Now, a balanced budget is not necessarily good. Russia has a balanced budget. They take 100% of your income and spend it all. <laughs> so balance is not the primary good. It's the level of the balance which determines how much is left in private hands for you and I to spend. What can be done? There once was a man with a difficult mule that needed to be broken in. And he took this uh, difficult mule to a famous mule trainer and uh, handed him over to the mule trainer who immediately uh, went over to the side of the yard and picked up a big plank. He whacked the mule across the nose with it. And the owner was a bit shocked and he said, is that how you train mules? And the trainer said, oh no, but first you must get their attention. <laughs> So tonight I've tried to draw your attention to the disastrous trends evident in taxation, in spending and in debts of the public sector. Now I hope I have your attention. What can be done? Firstly, we must arm ourselves with the facts. People often say to me, why are you preaching to the converted? I'm not preaching to the converted. I'm arming the converted. When Christ went to uh, save the world, he started with the disciples. He didn't start with those who opposed him. I'm here to arm the converted. We've prepared a booklet called the Taxpayer's Chart Book, and you'll see one extract from it in those uh, notes I handed you there. Now, if you fill out that form and send it back to me, in a few weeks or so, I'll send you back a Taxpayer's Chart Book. If you attach a cheque, we'll probably send it by return mark. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, we must communicate the facts to all of those who will listen. And that's why I bother to come to Sydney and drag myself away from a nice TV in Brisbane to talk to people like you. I believe it's important to communicate the facts to anybody who will listen. Our task is to create a climate of opinion which is hostile to waste and overspending in the public sector. Thirdly, we must watch what they are doing with their money and sensitise them to the fact that we are watching. And to this aim, Taxpayers United is setting up an Australia-wide Waste Watchers Network. His aim is to identify and publicise the incidents of wasteful expenditure by government departments and authorities. Fourthly, we are setting up trim committees to rate the performance of the politicians politicians merely reflect what the voters want. So we're going to start to inform the voters of what the politicians are doing and start demanding different types of politicians. We must support those politicians of any party who show responsibility. We must attempt to deny office to those politicians of any party who ignore the interest of that great mass of ordinary Australians to obey the nation's laws and pay the nation's bills. We must also remember that none of the problems of taxation, red tape, deficits, debts, unemployment are acts of God. <laughs> they are acts of politicians. All of these destructive policies were initiated by somebody. They were approved by somebody. And those somebodies are our elected representatives. And it gives me no pleasure to say that much of the damage was done while so-called free enterprise politicians were in charge of our parliaments. For example, the uh, Fraser government promised, among many things, to cut red tape. Judging from the results, I showed you tonight, they must have cut it lengthwise. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm continually told, uh, but Viv, if we go too far, if we did all the things that uh, you said, we'll lose office. In fact. I addressed a National Party meeting quite recently and uh, there was a, the Shadow Minister for uh, Social Welfare was there and he spoke after me and he said, I'd love to do all the things Viv says we should do, but if we did, we'd be a kamikaze party. We'd lose office. Well, they lost office anyhow. They also lost the confidence of their supporters, which will make it harder for them to regain office. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe the most important item on the Australian agenda is trim. 
tax reduction immediately. We must reduce the burden of taxation and reform the public sector or its dead weight will pull us all down. It's up to us to create an environment which supports the essential functions of government, but which is hostile to waste, duplication, inefficiency and monopoly in the public sector. We must trim the octopus. If the bureaucrats won't listen, we must cut off their income. If the politicians <coughs> won't listen, we must kick them in the ballot box. <laughs> we are all responsible for the slow death of freedom and enterprise in Australia. While we spend our time producing goods and services, the opponents of the free society spend their time speaking, writing and spreading their ideas, often from the security of the public payroll. We must match their ideas, their ideology, their persistence and their output. It's our inaction which is allowing this to happen. Public policy is no longer a spectator sport for those who value the free society. And it's certainly not our aim to try to divide Australia into those who work for government and those who don't. That damage has already been done with the creation of a privileged public sector which to those outside appears to grow more irrelevant, more expensive and more arrogant every day. But to those who receive work or subsidies from government, I say, we are, you are not our enemies. We are all in this boat together. We accept that many of you do not make the rules and that presently you may have no alternative. When the government spends 44% of our money, something like that percentage of people must work for government. All we ask of you is this. Do not give moral support to a system which, under the slogan of help for the poor, threatens to make us all poor. And there are those who believe that nothing can be done. Nothing can be changed. I believe an individual can change his environment. In fact, in this era of propaganda and public relations, I believe the only way to change things is for one individual to convince another. Mass propaganda is no longer working. We must establish a network of concerned individuals who will transmit that concern to their families, to their friends and to their employees. You know, a few of us in this room and others all over Australia started building this network 10 years ago. You've heard about the Centre 2000, the Adam Smith Club, the Australian Institute of Public Policy, Common Sense, Taxpayers United, Centre for Independent Studies. All of these people are trying to change things. And I think the more organisations we have, the more enthusiasm we'll have, the more resources we have. So I welcome all of those organisations as allies in the fight. For those of us who have been in this uh, fight for 10 years or more, we can certainly tell you we are changing the climate of opinion. We grow steadily in knowledge, in numbers, and in influence. I can certainly assure you that 10 years ago I didn't get eight interviews on radio as I have in the last two days. But the job is still huge, and we all know that many casualties have fallen by the wayside over that time. Now, if you are concerned about the future of the free society, I invite you to support something, somewhere. We need people to commit their human resources, because that's the, the most finite of all of our resources, is human resources. Or if you can't do that, contribute some financial resources. Both of them are welcome. And to uh, help you decide whether or not to, whether to make a, a commitment or a contribution, I remind you of the story of the chicken and the pig. One day a chicken and a pig were walking down the street and saw a sign, <coughs> bacon and eggs, two dollars. <laughs> what do you think of that, said the pig in horror. Oh, I guess that's life, said the chicken. It's all right for you, said the pig. For you, it's just a contribution. For me, it's a total commitment. <laughs>
time for a short period of questions. Someone like to begin the questions to the fourth. Yes, sir. Of course. I that Australian referendum have uh, never been uh, really uh, the affirmative. What, in your view, would be the effect of a, of a constitutional replacement to limit the spending of government? I'd like to know more about the situation which prevails in Switzerland, but people have told me that they use the referendum there very effectively, over, have used it over many years, to limit the size and growth and power of government. They continually put up sub submissions to increase uh, government uh, activity, to increase the tax rate, to decrease the working hours, and the people continually reject them, which gives some faith in democracy. In fact, I notice this wherever I go when I talk to someone like the uh, Liberal Party or the National Party. I find that the people in the grassroots agree with me, but the people in Parliament say, oh, no, that's just a bit too radical. So I think uh, any system which allows the people to say no, irrespective of what the politicians want, is a good system. Any further questions? Yes, sir. How do we uh, presume to your logic the fact that only one monopolies commission? <laughs> only one monopoly commission. It seems that the government. Oh. <coughs> how, how do we explain the fact there is only one monopolies commission? <laughs> yes, monopoly is a good one, isn't it? <laughs> the greatest operator of the most coercive and expensive and exploitive monopolies in the world is government. And yet they tell us that we must uh, beware of creating monopolies. In fact, uh, I think the antitrust laws and all of the attempts to uh, control the growth of monopolies have been perverse because most of them end up entrenching either a monopoly or a cartel in the area where they attempt to prevent it. In fact, the original definition, I read a book recently a book about uh, Richard the Lionheart. And Richard the Lionheart had uh, fought a few unsuccessful wars and his stocks weren't standing very high and he wanted to embark on another crusade and he didn't have any money and he couldn't pay the troops and he, he wasn't going to go to Parliament to impose more taxes because he thought he'd already imposed as much tax as the people would stand. In those days the barons were fairly rich and armed and they didn't take too much taxation. So he really was in a bit of a quandary. And so he said to his mother, he posed the problem to his mother, who was a very smart lady, and she said, well, it's very easy. You, you have lots of offices under the crown. You start selling offices under the crown. And so he sold the office of Chief Justice of England. He sold the office of Marshal of England. He, he, he uh, uh, ejected the bloke who was already in the office or offered him to buy his position. And then he started selling the right to buy and sell goods in a particular place. The right to import uh, tobacco into England and the right to trade with France and the right to sell woolen goods to somewhere else. And so, as Adam Smith said, that he defined a monopoly. Monopoly is a government grant of exclusive trading rights. And that is what it has always been. It started way back with Richard the Lionheart to finance some wars. possible, could you give us the figures on our national debt as a proportion of our GNP and our national debt payment as a proportion of our total tax revenues per annum? I know they're rather curly figures to pull out of your head, but uh, I think they're fairly relevant. Our debt is about 90 billion, our debt is about 90 billion, the GDP is 200 billion. So it's approaching half. And the debt is approaching half of our, our national income, 90 over 206. Uh, and, and the interest payments on our national debt as a proportion of our total tax payments or the government's total tax grab? Uh, the interest payments, uh, I said, were 9 billion. I'd say they're more like 10 billion now because I haven't looked for this year. And the uh, total 
Total spending by all levels of government is 90 billion, so they're one ninth. Total, total taxes are 60 billion, and total spending by the federal government is about 60. So the federal government it would be 10 over 60, although they're not all federal government debts. And the, the fairest figure would be 10 over 90 for the interest on the, on the government debt. 11%. Yeah. Mr. Yes. Chairman, could I make, I might just make this comment through you to the Speaker? Uh, I think we're all impressed by the level of government spending over money made by private economy. But I am perusing the uh, taxpayers' uh, submission here tonight and yours, I don't see any reference to people in the media. So, and I have not seen any reference in the media to those specific things you speak about. Now surely if you're going to make an impact, we have to get this over to the people. Not just the people here tonight, the people outside. Now, to what extent are we doing this? This this is a major impact. Do I make myself clear or yes, uh, yes. Uh, uh, are you confused I, uh, just as I am? I have never turned down an invitation to speak to the media. <laughs> I'm not talking Problem about that. Is, Who have we got in our ranks who are going to tell the media what to say? Yes, it, it is changing. Right. For the first time this year, uh, maybe last year as well, I have found we have started to get real friends in the media who, who ring up and ask for information, not because it just happens to be news and these people might have something interesting and offbeat to say. They ring me up and say, look, Somebody, some minister of such and such just said this, I reckon it's ridiculous. Can you give us a comment about it? Well, we've got about four people in, I don't know how many thousand media representatives there are, but we've got about four people now who are prepared to, to positively assist us get a, getting our message across. But even the uh, media in general are starting to see that what we're saying is becoming more popular. So they come to those people who've been saying it maybe longer than others, and, uh, and I'm sure we will increase the number of people we are getting to. But don't underestimate the amount of good that people like you can do. You can get the information from those who generate. With this, a pyramid of things has got to operate. I do not have time, neither does Greg Lindsay or Nadia or anybody else, have time to convert all of Australia one by one. We have to have disciples who get more disciples who get more disciples and they have to keep reinforcing and increasing the morale of one another but it has to be done in a, an increasing pyramid of people. Thank you very much. I think you've answered the question. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I ask our speaker that uh, with all the media representation of the uh, forthcoming tax summit, <coughs> Uh, to comment upon the paucity in the press and television on uh, the question of why they want to raise so much tax. The, it appears to me that most of the polemic arguments that appear are all involved with which is the best way to tax us, not whether we in fact should be facing an increased taxation, and I don't see the opposition members all coming out with, you know, a view that in fact taxes ought to go down, not that they should be reshuffled in some particular way. Now, why is there so little anti-argument to the government on this? The question is, why is there so little argument, or so little uh, putting forward of the view that we should be talking about the total level of tax rather than reshuffling the types of taxes we have. This has uh, come about because the government very cleverly set the scope for the tax summit to exclude uh, any change in the total level of taxes. That was one of the set points. They put it right outside the scope. Now, unfortunately, the media and the opposition and many other people in Australia play by their rules. I don't play by their rules. I continue to say this is a farce and a, a waste of time because the most important item on the agenda is not on the agenda. But unfortunately, most other people play by their rules.
set aside for a minute your personal bonus day. <laughs> I'm not going to ask questions as though I have a student of your organization, Taxpayers United. Questions that you probably dream that someone would ask. And I'm afraid to be, but I'm not a member of the group, but I'm fat to come up to that. I'm fat to pick it up on becoming a member. I want to be a Smith Club and I'm going to be a Smith Club. So I have a <laughs> I have a sense of the time and human resource investment you have put into this. I would like you to tell us a little bit about that. I do ask you to be like modesty because I know the time and the service that you have assigned. And second to that, that's the main question, but second to that, I would like you to explain just exactly what the Taxpayers United purpose is. The taxpayers united. What was it? Next word. Purpose. The purpose of taxpayers united is to uh, focus on waste and overspending in the government sector. Uh, to focus on taxation and misuse of taxation. The fairness of the tax system. We believe the tax system should be neutral. It should. Uh, tax everybody in the same fashion. It shouldn't discriminate and give uh, all sorts of benefits to the film industry and, and to tax some other industry. It, it should uh, treat individuals and companies and industries all on the same basis. It should be as simple as possible. It, sh it should be a minimum number of taxes. The, uh, the federal, state and local government should be responsible for their own taxes and their own spending, so we separate all of this into government transfer, which allows some people to be irresponsible with their, with their money. Uh, it's, and uh, we uh, seek the support of all taxpayers and people who support our own. So we've been going a year and uh, uh, we've grown to something like uh, 1,000 members in a year. Uh, we've uh, devoted considerable resources. My wife would probably answer that question better than I. You haven't answered my first question. Uh, I know you're very modest. I think it's very important to be able to some people understand the resources that have gone into this. And you have your wife to tell you that no plus. It's important we understand that you have the best of involved here. I guess. Uh, Ten years ago, I was uh, excavating under my house to, to make a new uh, room under the house. And I read in the Sydney Morning Herald about this new political party being formed, which was going to stand for uh, no taxes and selling the ABC and all sorts of radical ratbag things. I thought, this is marvellous and ridiculous. So I came to Sydney and got involved in the Workers' Party and I put that shovel down and I didn't pick it up again until last year. So that was one of, one of the costs. Our house is full of uh, Telex machines being run on the paper that Ross Graham Taylor gave me about five years ago. Uh, printing machines, um, books, um, paper and all sorts of things around the walls. Uh, we have devoted... Uh, we, we have no other hobbies, I suppose, except this. And uh, we hope in about five years' time it's not a hobby, it might pay. <coughs> Judy certainly contributes as much as I do to the, to the effort. I don't discourage anybody from getting involved with any political party. If somebody comes along to me and says, Dave, I think you're on the wrong track, you should work within the Liberal Party, I say, fine, go along and do something in the Liberal Party. If I can help you in that way, I'd be very pleased. If someone else says, I think we should uh, get behind the Democrats and try to get some sense into them, I say, good luck, I wish you well, I'll give you any assistance you can. I think no matter what somebody wants to do, there is an opportunity somewhere, somewhere to do it. And this is why I... I am a critic of those people who say we fritter our resources in so many different little organisations or political parties or whatever, business organisations, because that's a, 
being a victim of what I call the myth of constant human resources. They say, if only we devoted all of our activities to the Progress Party in this electorate, we would achieve something. As soon as, if we could move human beings around like chess men on a board and make that the law that CIS closed down, Taxpayers United closed down, Senate 2000 closed down, all of the other outlets for our energies and enthusiasm closed down, 60% of the people would also disappear because they want nothing to do with the progress part. And that would be the same no matter what avenue or what organisation was chosen. So we should encourage everybody to do what they believe is the right thing to do. Some of them will be proved wrong. Sometimes the, uh, the bloke who doesn't know any better will prove to have known wrong. So uh, I would encourage any activity in any political party. Make it hot for anybody anyway. Last year, understandably earlier in the year, and um, I asked the question of the speaker then, Mr. Keegan, I think I prefaced it in this way, that I understood that members of the news media were either socialist stroke communists or socialist stroke uh, uh, hibernate. <coughs> he delivered uh, what I think those who were present last you would remember as a short speech and answering, and finished up by saying something like this, that some 95% Stephen's words, of the Canberra Press Gallery would come under one or other of my question definitions. Definition of question. <coughs> if that is a fact, and uh, I am disinclined to question Mr. Stephen, uh, he apparently having been a member of that gallery, uh, and given that you have mentioned that you have had, had some 10 years experience in this field, I was wondering if in the, say, 10 years ahead, whether you could see yourself, referring to your own speech, becoming rather a William the Conqueror than a Richard Cour de Leon. <coughs> I, uh, I don't think, and I'm not sure whether this is answering your question, I don't think we should ignore the possibility that a lot of the things that we would like to see introduced may be introduced by those people that we would, that many people would currently define as left. Because you've got to look at history a little bit. If you go back to the last century, the later half of the last century, the two political movements, and this is true of almost every century, there are two major political movements. There is the movement of reform and there is the movement of conservatism, which is opposing that. In the latter part of the 1800s, the movement of conservatism was called the Tory party and the movement of reform was called the Whig party. And the Whigs supported low taxation, minimal government, limited constitutional monarchy, sound money, free trade pretty good party, a party of reform. By the, 90, uh, the end of the um, last century, by around the 1900s, the Whigs, are, and for reasons I don't quite, uh, I haven't found out yet, they went off the rails. The Liberal Party became socialist, the, uh, the Labor Party was formed, and from about, say, 1914, was about the watershed, if you had to put it down to a particular year. That was the watershed, and the Reform Party was the socialist, the socialist persuasion. Their goal, the Reform Party always has a goal. They have a particular position that they support. They will continually move towards it, given any opportunity. And opposing them are the Conservatives, the Tories. So for, the, for all of this century, we've had the Conservatives opposing the party of reform, the socialists. I believe we're at another watershed. All of the great things that the socialists suggested we try, we've tried. And instead of resting in a bed of uh, roses, we found ourselves in a cesspit full of barbed wire. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. There is no more reform that the socialists propose that can be tried. They've all been tried and found wanting. So the party of reform has got to be the party of privatisation, the party of minimal government, lower taxes, sound money, 
limited constitutional government. So what happens? Does the current Conservative Party suddenly turn into a party of reform, or does the current Reform Party turn into the new party of reform? And if you look at what's being said by people like Senator Walsh, some of the things being said by Keating and other people in the Labor Party, you have to wonder, and I don't think you should be setting your views as to who is going to introduce the things that we're talking about. And I'm not sure if that answered your question. It's at least vaguely related. <laughs> Going back to the original question that you had three or four ago about the issue of the media and the coverage that your ideas and the ideas of the new conservative right you accept that term, are getting in the media, I would ask you, do you think that the sycophants of the media, who are so adept at currying favour from their political masters, are really going to take notice of the new conservative right, if that conservative right hasn't got a political power base? And Will that new conservative right be able to manufacture a political power base from which it will be able to attract the sort of attention that it needs to continue to propagate its ideas throughout the community and develop a viable alternative to the creeping socialism that we're being sunk by at the moment? Yes, uh, it is a problem. You, uh, you have to get uh, some sort of political power before, or influence before anyone will take notice of you and uh, they won't take notice of you until you get that influence. And the media won't uh, take notice of you to some extent until you get that influence. So this is why I have never believed that the success was going to come quickly or easily. And I'm always suspicious of people that we convert very quickly because if somebody has so little uh, principles that they convert quickly to what we are about, uh, they're going to convert back again when the next persuasive speaker comes along. As far as the media is concerned, I think we've got to go back uh, and look at what other people who changed the course of history have done and tried to do. If you look at the American Revolution, they had problem getting their ideas across because the, the British controlled the media and they control it fairly directly. And so they established what were called the Committees of Correspondence. And Thomas Paine was one of those who did. And I guess it's no coincidence that I called my newsletter Common Sense because I was so impressed with what Thomas Paine did. They set up these Committees of Correspondence who were an alternative media, whose job was to assist one another, to inform one another, to set up the information networks. Uh, I can envisage the time, and it's not far distant, where on our computer we can have a telephone network set up so that when one day some politician suggests something, within one day we can get 5,000 telephone calls to him or all the people around him. And that will <laughs> seem like an avalanche. <laughs> so I believe we can do it ourselves in spite of the media. And as we change the climate of opinion, the politicians will reflect. The politicians don't make opinion, they follow. And when they perceive, and they only have to perceive it, public opinion is a very, very uh, hard thing to find out what it is. Uh, it's a bit like, as somebody said, it's like the palace ghost. Everybody is afraid of it, but nobody has seen it. Nobody's quite sure what public opinion is. And if we can play a great hand of bluff that all of the public are out there demanding a reduction in taxation, the politicians will hear They will jump in front with their banner saying, follow me. And suddenly we've got the political influence. So I don't know which, which has to be done first, but we've got to do all of those things to get the, the population talking about it, who then will influence the politicians in the media. Yes. Oh, sir. Uh, why did your obviously biased and prejudiced organisation only give the Progress Party a 99% <laughs> approval rating? Uh, <laughs> where did it go wrong? 
<laughs> the decision of the judges will be final and no correspondence will be. <laughs> state governments are relevant, should we abolish them? Well, I started my career as a public servant, as I told you, working for the Mines Department in Queensland. And uh, my first uh, few years were spent out in central Queensland on oil exploration, uh, geological exploration, uh, seconded to the Federal Bureau of Mineral Resources, who were so far much better funded and far better organised and, and basically nicer people that I, at that time, was a, a confirmed centralist. I believed that the, all of these, uh, these fiddly, uh, fuddy-duddy state organisations should go to be replaced by the central uh, government. But I've completely changed my views. I believe that uh, every politician, that the closer the politician is to home, the more responsible he will get. The further away from home they are, the more irresponsible they are, and the more hothouse their uh, living environment is. If you go to the Canberra, the uh, government company town, you have people there, <laughs> three generations of people, who have never lived in any other environment except government environment. I think that's most unhealthy. We also need to look at these two terms. In fact, I had to write to one of our members of Taxpayers United who had a letter published uh, which uh, contradicted what I'm saying now and I explained it to him. He talked about uh, reducing duplication. You really have to make a differentiation between duplication and decentralisation. For there to be, in this example that I quoted, an Attorney General's Department in Brisbane administering the, the registering titles for Queenslanders, another Attorney General in New South Wales doing the same for New South Welshmen. That is not duplication, that is decentralisation. But for there to be a health department in Brisbane and another health department in Canberra overlooking the same people in Queensland, that is duplication. And in every case where there is duplication, except for defence, foreign affairs, quarantine and very little else, I would go in favour of getting rid of the federal government body and leaving it with the states. We will then attack the states and put it all the interesting on that subject to read the Constitution and I read the Constitution recently uh, and my purpose was to prove a point which I didn't prove by reading the Constitution but I found out a few other things. If you read the Constitution it is very clear that the purposes of Federation were defence, foreign affairs, uh, probably quarantine or that's, that's not so very clear but the other one which is obvious is free trade between states. The reason for Federation was to get ra rid of the Queensland Customs Barrier and the preference for New South Wales goods and all sorts of things like that. And uh, that's unfortunately one of the things they didn't do very well. But those things I think are done best by the government and all of the others should come down as far as possible. I've got time for about two more questions. Right. Uh, what you've described in your, in your talk is a massive misuse of capital. Won't the situation in reality resolve itself by a massive financial crash and won't it be only then that most people will listen to the so-called converted? I think there's a possibility that what you say will come true. Uh, if you look at the world monetary situation, it really is in a mess. Money is, is the lifeblood of a, of a trading society as we have. And there is a disease in that monetary blood which has started off in the banana republics and now has spread to most of the world. There is no example in history of such a monetary situation writing itself gradually. So unfortunately it appears to me that there will be some sort of crisis, a banking crisis, a financial crisis, an inflation crisis, some sort of crisis of varying intensity, I believe this decade, which will force a very dramatic realignment in what's going on. I believe that gives even greater urgency as to what we're saying here today because 
at such a time, there will be many voices around saying, the biggest problem we have is free enterprise. This dog-eat-dog, unstable, boom and bust, uncoordinated system that we have is the cause of all of these problems. If only you would give us politicians more power to regulate, control, moderate and provide orderly markets in this area, that will all be a thing of the past. If there are no voices around saying persuasively and conclusively at that time that the problem is government itself, unfortunately at that crisis time we could go into an even worse situation than we have now. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have uh, a quick question. Uh, I'm worried that we are all becoming bureaucratic in as much as you have not respond, responded to a, uh, a friend of mine over here who has used the term new conservative right. Is there anyone in Australia that can help us understand right, left, conservative, radical? It is you. Uh, I'd be concerned if the out of state club Senate 2000 or your own organization, Taxpayers United, let that term go uncommented. New conservative right is a very strange term. Please educate us as to what we are today. And let's not worry about membership. Let's get quality first and quantity second. Let's educate us as to what you are all about in those terms, new conservative right. Are you suggesting we should call ourselves the new conservative right? Well, I'm asking you to explain that. I, I, I don't accept my friend's uh, terms. I find them very strange and very uh, <coughs> inhibiting. I don't believe we live in that mold. Embarrass me, if you will, or else explain where we do live in the spectrum. I have uh, uh, put together uh, <laughs> two or three years ago what I call the... Uh, uh, in order to promote uh, one of my publications, I call it the Common Sense Political Matrix, which has got uh, two axes, and up along one axis is uh, individual freedom. This is the extent to which governments allow people to live their own lives, whether it harasses them about what they read and what they smoke, and whether they're allowed to speak uh, what they like, and whether they're allowed to have strange religions, or all of those things which are generally referred to as civil liberties. And along the other axis is the economic freedoms, whether they allowed you to, to open your hardware shop without finding you half a million dollars, or whether they allow you to buy and sell at whatever price you like, and you know, whether they confiscate most of your goods in, in taxes. If you look at those two axes, you get a matrix. Those people who are usually described as right are those that will give you economic freedom and no political freedom, and those who are usually described as political left are those who will give you the, the right to smoke pot but not the right to, to, uh, to sell hammers on Sunday. So they're both inconsistent and if you look at those two things they will both tend to come to the middle and if you look at that matrix there is a group of philosophies running up the middle going from those who want total control of both things which are communist systems to limited control of both things, to, you know, to, to uh, varying amounts of control, to limited control of both things, to no control of either thing. It's anarchy. You've got anarchy, totalitarianism. In here you've got bureaucracy, those people who don't want to control everything but they have no particular principles. Let us decide on the merits of each issue. And up towards the top end of that, we have a limited government position where we hope most people in this room would support limited government intervention in both private lives and economic things, limited to prevention of fraud, force, coercion, misrepresentation, breach of contract, any of those things which most normal people would uh, want to oppose. So you've got totalitarianism, bureaucracy, limited government, anarchy. Those are the as I, as I see it, the four consistent political philosophies of we stand for the government. Set out at some length. 
but as a Victorian, fortunate to be in your midst tonight. <coughs> My ears pricked up at the mention of giving your talk on our martyr, Frank and Pandre. And I say our martyr advisedly because Frank is a member, I believe, of the Melbourne branch of the Alex Rifle Club. Certainly he comes to meetings. Uh, the fine of half a million dollars to the Pekinson of that fine is that less than half a mile away in St Kilda it is lawful to do on Sundays what was unlawful for him to do to cost him half a million dollars. <laughs> Beyond that, he was flung into jail. They let him out because for health reasons they felt they might run a liability suit or something like that. Um, maybe there's another reason for it. Frank, I think, would um, be shoe the description, but I think in five, perhaps ten years' time, at least in Victoria, possibly not yet, he would come to be thought as the carrier share of the productive sector. <laughs> <laughs> I'd now like to invite Mr. Ross Graham Taylor to give the vote of thanks. Just briefly, Ross was a co-founding director of the Australian Adam Smith Club and was also a large part of why the Centre for Independent Studies is as healthy as, as it is today. So Ross, would you please come and give the vote of thanks. It's about the best thing I can recommend for settling uh, my stomach after listening to that. Bill finally acknowledged the fact that he was associated with the political movement. I became aware of Bill somewhere in the early era, perhaps eight years ago, I don't know. And always when, it, when I'm with him and hear him speak, my total reaction, even when I'm not with him, is utter humility because Bill's utter persistence, devotion to, to, the, to the cause he's, he adopted and the support that his wife has uh, provided, given, I don't know how they work it out, but I know if I had that much time to do a hobby such as Boof does, there, there wouldn't be much home life, not this much now. <laughs> That's another issue. All of the things I was going to talk about have all been answered questions. The war of the movements have been started and generated in ways. And I had the privilege of hearing that accountability in government given by Viv at Brisbane last year and it floored me as it floored you people. I was wondering if there were going to be any questions after it but well, they've been still going on forever I think gradually people realise there's so much in this discussion but I think one of the things that Viv uh, mentioned a little bit is the, uh, the fragmentation of the impact that we're trying to create with this movement which I define not as left and right, but freedom or slavery, I mean, it's much simpler than that it was all explained to just freedom or slavery, is how difficult it is to communicate with people. What a great deal of learning, and all those early days of political uh, enthusiasm that, that Whitlam engendered, have devolved into all sorts of organisations, uh, from, from the CIS right on the academic peak, down to... Uh, uh, I don't know, me, I guess. It just sort of keeps the records. But all the way, we've all been working very hard at learning what the proper problems are. And I think Boop's niche that he's filled in this thing is, is uh, of tremendous merit because he's the nearest thing to a link between what should happen and how to make it happen. And I humbled in his presence, and I'd like you to be upstanding and thank you for coming all the way to Sydney to help us.